Hi guys, Tony Dubbed here and today I'm going to be doing a video on if it's worth overclocking the ridiculously expensive Intel Core i9-9900K. Now unlike a lot of videos that you will find online, including guides, I'm not looking at reaching the core, the top core clock that you could potentially achieve at a ridiculously high temperature. I'm looking at what you could realistically achieve and you'd like to actually run stable for years to come. In this respect, I wanted a PC that was gonna be overclocked in some respect, but also running 100% stable. Now, if you're wondering what's inside my system, apart from the Intel Core i9, there's also the Asus Maximus um, XI Hero Wi-Fi uh, motherboard, which will be of interest over here. In terms of RAM, I've got the XPG um, Spectrix uh, D41 running at 3600 megahertz um, as well, and that was via the XMP1 profile. Now, I'll go into all my BIOS settings, but I do want to mention something right from the get-go. Just because my chip um, will be able to do certain things or not certain things, the same goes with you. It is purely silicon lottery. Because you read on some guides and videos, some people reaching 5.2 gigahertz at 1.1 volts, you sometimes wonder to yourself, why am I not hitting 5 gigahertz when I'm pushing near 1.4 volts? So this is purely due to silicon lottery. And I found that out after basically two to three weeks of overclocking and testing. And I found out that the chip and the silicon lottery that I got personally on my chip wasn't good. That doesn't mean that it's a bad chip. It's more the fact that in comparison to other chips you can find out there, it won't be as good. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this and I really want to emphasize this is because this is not a cherry pick chip that some benchmarkers or reviewers would have got. Mine is literally a retail chip that you can literally buy everywhere. So now with that out of the way, let me go and show you my BIOS. Bam, just like that, we're into the BIOS. Now, hopefully you know how to get into the BIOS, hit the delete key or the F2 key, depending on your system. So this is my BIOS and you might look at it straight away and think to yourself, whoa, this is pretty simplistic. This is not like what all the other guides tell me. And yes, you will not be mistaken. In fact, if you look in the description below, yes, that's down below, you'll see me posting a thread on overclock.net and being like, why on earth does my system not work and why is it constantly getting crashes? To the point where I actually reached out to Intel and Intel ran me through the BIOS settings that I should run. And this is actually their recommended settings and funnily enough, the only settings that actually really worked with my system. So first of all, AIO overclock tuner. Now you might have it differently if you have a different uh, motherboard uh, slash different BIOS. Um, but AI overclock tuner, essentially you want to have this on XMP1. That is essentially for you to run your RAM at the recommended uh, timings and also the recommended speed plus the recommended voltage. So once that is done, the BCLK frequency will automatically set to 100. Um, then you got Asus multi-core enhancement. Now traditionally, I've always disabled this setting. Um, as you might be able to read at the bottom, basically it says disable is Intel default core. Um, Asus optimized is auto and optimized or basically maximum performance is uh, enabled. So. What I would actually suggest is for you to work it out um, via, via uh, benchmark afterwards, and I'll show you this in a while. But in my case, I had to have it enabled in order for the core clock, which is um, 4.7 gigahertz, to actually run at 4.7 gigahertz. Without that, with this um, disabled or on auto, I wouldn't get that 4.7 gigahertz on the full load. Now, SVID behavior, leave it on auto. Now, AVX, now I put it for seven for the sake of demonstration. In fact, what you want to do is run it on auto. Now, the reason behind this is because a lot of guides actually tell you, oh, you need to put AVX3 or AVX4 or something like that. Now, when I did this, what I found is that when I was putting load on the PC, and therefore putting a sort of like benchmark, what it would do is that even though the benchmark wasn't using AVX instructions, and in case you are wondering what AVX instruction is, again, that'll be down in the description below. There'll be a thorough guide uh, on a website for that. Essentially what it does, it drops the core clock. So for example, when I had seven over here, what it would do is drop my 4.7 gigahertz overclock down to four gigahertz, which, you know, it's a massive drop. Obviously that was because of seven, because for the sake of doing it of the video um, and for testing. If I have it on auto, it ran at 4.7 consistently. So unless you are specifically running an AVX instruction program and 
I'm sure there is only a very handful of them out there on the uh, out there, uh, let alone from synthetic benchmarks. I would highly suggest you leave it on auto. If, however, you find that you are running uh, on AVX uh, program, then you might want to tailor this to maybe level three, level four, level five, depending on what your overclock is. The higher the overclock, as in the higher that like that number is, so if it was 5.52, so 5.2 gigahertz, I would probably be inclined to run it at four to five. If I'm running at four seven, I'd be inclined to running it at three or two. So of course, your mileage may vary. Now, what I would suggest straight away is to sync all cores and then do 4.7, which is 4.7 gigahertz. Start from there and then work out your overclock as to what you can then achieve. BCLK frequency, all of these things are auto. They are literally auto. The only thing that's being set here via XMP1 is the uh, DDR4 frequency. DRAM timing controls, again, you're not gonna have to touch these, but you can see that what the XMP profile does, it will set your RAM timings. Then external DJI plus power, again, a, a thing that I have always traditionally used. Over here, Intel said, leave everything on auto, um, whereas on all the overclocking guides I came across, they all tweaked around with it, and I, and I thought that's exactly what you have to do. Unfortunately not, leave that on auto. Intel CPU power management, speed step, leave that enabled, turbo mode, leave that enabled. If you don't have turbo mode, you'll be running at 3.6 gigahertz, which is the normal core clock of the, um, the, the processor. Tweakers power realized, you're not gonna have to touch that. AI features, in my case, I stopped training because I didn't want it to train. Core cache um, limit, minimum, and um, maximum. Again, leave these on auto. A lot of guides set four, four, three, so, 4.3 gigahertz. Um, in my case, auto just worked fine. BCLK adaptive voltage, leave that enabled. Then the most important setting out of all of these is offset mode. Now, the reason I say it's the most important because every guide I came across, including my old guides that I previously done on the i7, all went with manual mode. And traditionally, that's what you normally did. Intel, however, advised me that offset mode is actually what really works out best with your chip. What you should do is set it to offset mode and start with, uh, start with 0.100. Now the reason you'd start with 0.100 because that is a pretty, I don't know, adventurous sort of um, overclock, as in the amount of voltage you're gonna be shoving through it is pretty adventurous with that minus, uh, minus 100. In my case, I had to use it at minus um, 0.100. So not that great as you can see as, as for a chip, whereas you might get a much better result even at 5 gigahertz you might be running on what I did. So just worth bearing in mind. DRAM voltage got set by XMP as you can see over there. The rest of these things are completely on auto. In terms of the advanced one, as you'll be able to see, this is just, I'm showing you my BIOS, but you can see the CPU configuration as well. Everything is on auto. CPU power management, again, everything on auto. Leave your uh, C states as well on auto as well. ERP, I would suggest leaving it on disabled, and you can see a video down below uh, in case you're interested as to why you might want to do that. So now when we're done with the BIOS, go to exit and save changes. So now we've booted into Windows. Now if you didn't make it this far, as in if you didn't get to boot into Windows, it simply means you need to add a little bit more voltage. So it decrease that uh, minus sign, in other words, if you had minus 100, go minus um, 090 or 095, and again, try to boot into Windows. Once you successfully boot into Windows, you're gonna want a few applications. Core Temp, CPU Z, HW Info, Prime 95, and RealBench. Now, all of these programs have their, their sort of quirks and they all have their different functionalities. HW Info gives you a lot of information on a variety of different sensors, but the one we're most interested in is the vCore. The reason why this is better than CPU Z is because it's said to have a little bit more accurate readings. Treat it as you will, but CPU Z is also a very good indicator and also a really quick, easy glance at seeing what your core voltage is without having to sift through all a lot of, a lot of data that you'd normally see on HW Info. Core temp is extremely important in order to monitor your temperatures. Now I've got a Noctua D15 and when I was running at five gigahertz, I was pushing 95 to 100 degrees centigrade, which is what Intel would require at or say it's a TJ Maxx. In other words, the maximum temperature the processor can run at. 
Now, this is extremely important because you have to bear in mind that again, a lot of benchmarkers or people will be running some custom loops, as in water-cooled loops or all-in-one coolers with some massive radiators. In my case, I'm running a pretty somewhat an ordinary build with a pretty fat ass cooler but even then I was reaching really high temperatures. Now the point is over here is that we don't want really high temperatures. For a stable overclock and for something that you're going to be using on a 24-7 basis, of course you might disagree with me, is the fact that you want relatively low temperatures so your fans don't ramp up to maximum and therefore is pretty quiet in terms of a build. If, however, you don't mind having a relatively loudish um, system, then by all means, push your um, processor to its absolute limit. And therefore, if you're gonna be gaming, just expect that those fans are gonna ran, ramp up to 100%. In my case, I want them to be running at, let's say, 60 to 50%, so that my PC is actually very quiet when it's sitting next to me, rather than running at full pelt. So, once you've done all of this, once you've installed all of these and you, you're aware of your limitations and what you should be looking for, you should go ahead and run Prime95. Now once you open Prime95, it'll come up with a box like this, and then what you want to do is hit Custom and disable AVX2 and AVX. There's a way of disabling AVX permanently via read, um, a readme file that you can add within the Prime95, but if you just do this, it will also disable AVX. As I mentioned before, AVX is different. You can read more about it in the description below, but what AVX does is essentially makes it a lot harder for the processor to do um, well some calculations and also will ramp up your temperatures significantly higher. Now, run Prime95 for a couple of minutes. When I say a couple of minutes, it's because here we're essentially trying to find what, a vol what voltage we can get away with. Now, the reason this is important is because you want to find the maximum overclock that you want at a voltage that you're comfortable with. In my opinion, I would run at anything with a minus offsite, um, offset sign, which was also recommended by Intel, but also at something that hasn't got temperatures that really exceed a lot. You can see right now I'm at 100% load and yet despite 100% load I'm running at 53 centigrade. You will find that in, with my chip I'm running at 5 gigahertz even within a couple of minutes these temperatures sh uh, soar up to around 85 to 95 centigrade and that means to me that if I was going to run Prime95 for 24 hours my chip would overheat and or throttle and therefore will therefore negate the overclock that I've got. So my suggestion would be find that medium that you have between the core overclock and the voltage that you set. In my case, I had to stick to 4.7 because when I was pushing past 4.7 going to 4.8, 4.9 and 5 gigahertz, I was having to push more volts to it, through it and therefore by pushing more volts through it, I would have an increased temperature. Hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, be sure to ask me down in the comments below. Now, when you have worked out a somewhat stable, when we're saying stable, I'm saying couple of minutes on prime at a voltage that you're relatively happy with, that doesn't increase temperatures ridiculously high, then we can actually start with real bench, which essentially is a benchmark that you can run for eight hours. Now, real bench is also likely to fail, just like very much like prime does. However, this stress test is um, somewhat, not say bulletproof, but once you do run it for eight hours, then you know you're 100% stable. Now, when you are setting up, you want to go stress test, hit eight hours, and then um, put the maximum amount of RAM. In my case, it's two times eight gigabyte, which is 16 gigabytes of RAM, then press start. You'll see a lot of, well, boxes appearing and things like that, that's absolutely normal, and then just leave it run. Now, if there's any sort of instability or any sort of problems, um, RealBench will either crash, blue screen, or they'll be on this little red box over here. It will say something like instability detected or fault or something like that. At which point you have to increase the voltage again. And then again, go through the whole process of running Prime for a couple of minutes, stopping Prime, then going back to RealBench. In this way, you will be able to assure yourself that you've got a somewhat stable system from the get-go, and then also a fully stable system that you know will run the extended eight hours. Now, I know eight hours isn't exactly achievable for a lot of people. However, I, that's what I would very much suggest. Once you're getting close to a stage that you think you're going to be overclocked and you, you've got a voltage and core clock that you think you're happy with, the eight-hour benchmark essentially can be run overnight. So run it, go to sleep, 
come back, if it's crashed, increase the voltage a little bit, um, then you know you will get yourself your stable overclock. So now you're back with me. And ultimately, I set out in this video to see if it was actually worth overclocking. And so far, all I've given you is an overclocking guide. Don't worry, I ran a multitude of benchmarks. A lot, in fact. Here, I was able to compare my 4.7 GHz overclock, which I showed you via the exact methods over here, and the 5 GHz um, overclock that I had, where I had to shove a lot of voltage through it. Here, you'll be able to see that actually 5 GHz didn't come out on top in a lot of the benchmarks. And you might be wondering, that's a bit silly. Why is that the case? You've got something clearly wrong. If you think about it logically, the 5 GHz overclock was at a high voltage. And therefore, um, in order for LLC to kick in and therefore um, account for the v droop that's happening, it was basically giving me an not say unstable, but giving me a voltage that was constantly fluctuating. And that fluctuation of um, of voltages meant that the benchmarks sometimes were not getting that full 5 gigahertz that they should be doing. And before you say it, yes, they were all five, um, all eight cores running at 5 gigahertz. I wasn't running the stock Intel system that ramps up a few cores to 5 gigahertz and the rest of them at 4.7, 4.8, or whatever have you. They're all running at 5 gigahertz, and I can guarantee you that. What I'm trying to say over here is that the 5 gigahertz overclock wasn't actually worth it. In fact, in some cases, was worse for my system personally than my 4.7 gigahertz overclock. So is it worth overclocking? In my case, I would say, and my personal experience is that you should overclock in a way that all your cores are running at a certain speed rather than a couple of cores running at different speeds versus the other cores running at a lower speed or running at 3.6 gigahertz. I definitely think that if you got this chip, you should definitely try and exploit the fact that you can run all these cores at a certain speed. Now that doesn't mean that you're going to be hitting 5 gigahertz, which is claimed on the box, and therefore you know every overclocking video you might ever come across all claims that you know they get 5 gigahertz. That might just not be the case for you, and like it wasn't for me. That's not a bad thing. It's just remember that these benchmarks or these claims or whatever have you some of them are based on very short amount of testing whilst other people is pure lottery and pure luck they've got you know a great chip and that's good for them but that might not apply to you so don't feel disheartened like i don't feel disheartened i've got 4.7 gigahertz running across eight cores running at an average temperature of around 65 centigrade i'm very very happy with that that extra 0.3 gigahertz is not going to change my life. It's not going to change anything. And actually, through my benchmarks, you'll be able to see it didn't actually change any sort of numbers or give me that extra sort of performance that I was going to be longing for and therefore having to run my fans at 100% versus running them at, let's say, 30 to 40%. So there we have it, guys. I've been totally dubbed. Hopefully, this video has been informative, has been helpful, has been a little bit insightful, and definitely has been a little bit different from all the other videos you might find on the Intel Core i9. Hopefully, this video has helped. If it has, make sure you give it a like, subscribe if you want to see more, favorite, share, all that good stuff, and definitely let me know in the comments below what overclock you got with what voltage or what offset, shall I say and I'll be very much intrigued to know if you got a better sil silicon lottery than I did. Alright guys, I've been totally done. Take care and bye-bye.